Preface to the Untroubled Mind by Herbert Hall, M.D. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carol Box. Preface A very wise physician has said that every illness has two parts, what it is, and what the patient thinks about it. What the patient thinks about it is often more important and more troublesome than the real disease. What the patient thinks of life, what life means to him, is also of great importance and may be the bar that shuts out all real health and happiness. The following pages are devoted to certain ideals of life which I would like to give to my patients, the long-time patients who have especially fallen to my lot. They are not all here. The steps to health and happiness. The reader may even be annoyed and baffled by my indirectness and unwillingness to be specific. That I cannot help. It is a personal peculiarity. I cannot ask anyone to live by rule, because I do not believe that rules are binding and final. There must be character behind the rule, and then the rule is unnecessary. All that I have written has doubtless been presented before, in better ways, by wiser men, but I believe that each writer may expect to find his small public, his own particular public who can understand and profit by his teachings, having partly or wholly failed with the others. For that reason I am encouraged to write upon a subject usually shunned by medical men, being assured of at least a small company of friendly readers. I am grateful to a number of friends and patients who have read the manuscript of the following chapters. These reviewers have been frank and kind and very helpful. I am particularly indebted to Dr. Richard C. Cabot, who has given me much valuable assistance. End of preface. Chapter 1 of The Untroubled Mind by Herbert J. Hall, M.D. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1. The Untroubled Mind Canst thou not minister to a mind diseased, pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow, raise out the written troubles of the brain, and with some sweet oblivious antidote, cleanse the stuffed bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon the heart? Macbeth when a man tells me he never worries, I am inclined to think that he is either deceiving himself or trying to deceive me. The great roots of worry are conscience, fear, and regret. Undoubtedly we ought to be conscientious and we ought to fear and regret evil. But if it is to be better than an impediment and a harm, our worry must be largely unconscious and intuitive. The moment we become conscious of worry, we are undone. Fortunately, or unfortunately, we cannot leave conscience to its own devices unless our lives are big enough and fine enough to warrant such a course. The remedy for the mental unrest, which is in itself an illness, lies not in an enlightened knowledge of the harmfulness and ineffectiveness of worry, not even in the acquirement of an unconscious conscience but in the living of a life so full and good that worry cannot find place in it. That idea of worry and conscience, that definition of serenity, simplifies life immensely. To overcome worry by substituting development and growth need never be dull work. To know life in its farther reaches, life in its better applications, is the final remedy, the great undertaking, it is life. We must warn ourselves, not infrequently, that the larger life is to be pursued for its own glorious self and not for the sake of peace. Peace may come, a peace so sure that death itself cannot shake it, but we must not expect all our affairs to run smoothly. As a matter of fact, they may run badly enough. We shall have our ups and downs, we shall sin and repent, and sin again, but if in the end we live according to our best intuitions, we shall be justified, 
and we need not worry about the outcome. To put it another way, if we would have the untroubled mind, we must transfer our conscientious efforts from the small details of life, from the worry and fret of common things, into another and higher atmosphere. We must transfigure common life, dignify it and ennoble it. Then, although the old causes of worry may continue, we shall have gained a stature that will make us unconscious masters of the little troubles, and in a great degree equal to the larger requirements. Life will be easier, not because we make less effort, but because we are working from another and a better level. If such a change, and it would be a change for most of us, could come about instantly, in a flash of revelation, that would be ideal, but it would not be life. We must return again and again to the old uninspired state wherein we struggle conscientiously with perverse details. I would not minimize the importance and value of this struggle, only the sooner it changes its level the better for everyone concerned. Large serenity must, finally, be earned through the toughening of moral fibre that comes in dealing squarely with perplexing details. Some of this struggle must always be going on, but serener life will come when we begin to concern ourselves with larger factors. How are we to live the larger life? Partly through uninspired struggle and through the brave meeting of adversity, but partly, also, in a way that may be described as out of hand, by intuition, by exercise of the quality of mind that sees visions and grasps truths beyond the realm of common thought. I am more and more impressed with the necessity of inspiration in life if we are to be strong and serene and so finally escape the pitfalls of worry and conscience. By inspirations I do not mean belief in any system or creed. It is not a stated belief that we need to begin with. That may come in time. We need first to find in life, or at least in nature, an essential beauty that makes its own true, inevitable response within us. We must learn to love life so deeply that we feel its tremendous significance, until we find in the sea and the sky the evidence of an overbrooding spirit too great to be understood, but not too great to satisfy the soul. This is a sort of mother religion, the matrix from which all sects and creeds are born. Its existence in us dignifies us and makes simple, purposeful and receptive living almost inevitable. We may not know why we are living according to the dictates of our inspiration, but we shall live so, and that is the important consideration. If I urge the acquirement of a religious conception that we may cure the intolerable distress of worry, I do what I have already warned against. It is so easy to make this mistake that I have virtually made it on the same page with my warning. We have no right to seek so great a thing as religious experience that we may be relieved of suffering. Better go on with pain and distress than cheapen religion by making it a remedy. We must seek it for its own sake, or rather, we must not seek it at all, lest, like a dream, it elude us, or change into something else, less holy. Nevertheless, it is true that if we will but look with open, unprejudiced eyes, again and again, upon the sunrise or the stars above us, we shall become conscious of a presence greater and more beautiful than our minds can think. In the experience of that vision, strength and peace will come to us unbidden. We shall find our lives raised, as by an unseen force, above the warfare of conscience and worry. We shall begin to know the meaning of serenity and of that priceless, if not wholly to be acquired, possession, the untroubled mind. I am aware that I shall be misunderstood and perhaps ridiculed by my colleagues when I attempt to discuss religion in any way. Theology is a field in which I have no training, but that is the very reason why I dare write of it. I do not even assume that there is a God in the traditional sense. 
the idea is too great to be made concrete and literal no single fact of nature can be fully understood by our finite minds but i do feel vaguely that the laws that compass us and make our lives possible point always on beyond the realms of time and space toward the existence of a mighty overruling spirit if this is a cold and inadequate conception of god it is at least one that can be held by any man without compromise the modern mind is apt to fail of religious understanding and support because of the arbitrary interpretations of religion which are presented for our acceptance it is what men say about religion rather than religion itself that repels us let us think it out for ourselves if we are open to a simple even primitive conception of god we may still repudiate the creeds and doctrines but we are likely to become more tolerant of those who find them true and good we shall be likely in time to find the religion of christ understandable and acceptable warm and quick with life the man who ungrudgingly opens his heart to the god of nature will be religious in the simplest possible sense he may worry because of the things he cannot altogether understand and because he falls so far short of the implied ideal but he will have enlarged his life so much that the common worries will find little room he will be too full of the joy of living to spend much conscious thought in worry such a man will realize that he cannot afford to spend his time and strength in regretting his past mistakes there is too much in the future what he does in the future not what he has failed to do in the past will determine the quality of his life he knows this and the knowledge sends him into that future with courage and with strength finally in some indefinable way character will become more important to him than physical health even illness is half compensated when a man realizes that it is not what he accomplishes in the world but what he is that really counts which puts him in touch with the creative forces of god and raises him out of the aimless and ordinary into a life of inspiration and joy end of chapter one Chapter Two of the Untroubled Mind by Herbert J. Hall, M.D. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two Religio Medici. At all events, it is certain that if any medical man had come to Middlemarch with the reputation of having definite religious views, of being given to prayer and of otherwise showing an active piety, there would have been a general presumption against his medical skill george eliot when a medically educated man talks and writes of religion and of god he is rightly enough questioned by his brothers who are too busy with the hard work of practice to be concerned with anything but material problems to me the word god is symbolic of the power which created and which maintains the universe the sunrise and the stars of heaven give me some idea of his majesty the warmth and tenderness of human love give me some idea of his divine love that is all i know but it is enough to make life glow it is enough to inspire the most intense devotion to any good cause it is enough to make me bear suffering with some degree of patience and it is enough finally to give me some confidence and courage even in the face of the great mystery of death why this or another conception of god should produce such a profound result upon any one i do not know except that in some obscure way it connects the individual with the divine plan and does not leave him outside in despair and loneliness however that may be it will be conceded that a religious conception of some kind does much toward justifying life toward making it strong and livable and so has directly to do with certain important problems of illness and health the most practical medical man will admit that any illness is made lighter and more likely to recover in the presence of hope and serenity in the mind of the patient 
naturally the great bulk of medical practice calls for no handling other than that of the straight medical sort a man comes in with a crushed finger a girl with anemia the way is clear it is only in deeper more intricate departments of medicine that we altogether fail the bacteriologist and the pathologist have no use for mental treatment in their departments but when we come to the case of the nervously broken down school teacher or the worn-out telegrapher that is another matter years may elapse before work can be resumed years of dependence and anxiety here a new view of life is often more useful than drugs a view that accepts the situation reasonably after a while that does not grope blindly and impatiently for a cure but finds in life an inspiration that makes it good in spite of necessary suffering and limitations often enough we cannot promise a cure but we must be prepared to give something better a great deal of the fatigue and unhappiness of the world is due to the fact that we do not go deep enough in our justification for work or play or for any experience happy or sad there is a good deal of a void after we have said art for art's sake or play for the joy of playing or even after we have said i am working for the sake of my family or for someone who needs my help that is not enough and whether we realize it or not the lack of deeper justification is at the bottom of a restlessness and uncertainty which we might not be willing to acknowledge but which nevertheless is very real i am not satisfied when some moralist says be good and you will be happy the kind of happiness that comes from a perfunctory goodness is a thing which i cannot understand and which i certainly do not want if i work and play and serve and employ making up the fabric of a busy life if i attain a very real happiness i am tormented by the desire to know why i am doing it and i am not satisfied with the answer i usually get the patient may not be cured when he is relieved of his anemia or when his emaciation has given place to the plumpness and suppleness and physical strength that we call health the man whom we look upon as well and who has never known physical illness is not well in the larger sense until he knows why he is working why he is living why he is filling his life with activity in spite of the elasticity and spring of the world's interests there must come often with a kind of fatal insistence the deep demand for a cause for a justification if there is not an adequate significance behind it life with all its courage and accomplishment seems but a sorry thing so full of pathos even in its brightest moments so shadowed with a sense of loss and of finality that the bravest heart may well fail and the truest courage relax supported only by the assurance that this way lies happiness or that right is right what is this knowledge that the world is seeking but can never find what is this final justification if we seek it in its completeness we are doomed always to be ill and unsatisfied if we are willing to look only a little way into the great question if we are willing to accept a little for the whole content because it is manifestly part of the final knowledge and because we know that final knowledge rests with god alone we shall understand enough to save us from much sorrow and painful incompleteness there is in the infinitely varied and beautiful world of nature and in the hearts of men so much of beauty and truth that it is a wonder we do not all realize that these things of common life may be in us and for us the daily and hourly expression of the infinite being we call god we do not see god but we do feel and know so much that we may fairly believe to be of god that we do not need to see him face to face it is something more than imagination to feel that it is the life of god in our lives so often unrecognized or ignored that prompts us to all the greatness and the inspiration and the accomplishment of the world 
if we could know more clearly the joy of such a conception we should dry up at its source much of the unhappiness which is in a deep and subtle way at the bottom of many a nervous illness and many a wretched existence the happiness which is found in the recognition of kinship with god through the common things of life in the experiences which are so significant that they could not spring from a lesser source the happiness which is not sought but which is the inevitable result of such recognition this experience goes a long way toward making life worth living if we do have this conception of life then some of the old old questions that have vexed so many dwellers upon the earth will no longer be a source of unhappiness or of illness of mind or body the question of immortality for instance which has made us afraid to die will no longer be a question we shall not need to answer it in the presence of god in our lives and in the world about us we shall be content finally to accept whatever is in store for us so it be the will of god we may even look for something better than mere immortality something more divine than our gross conception of eternal life this is a religion that i believe medical men may teach without hesitation whenever the need shall arise i know well enough that many a blunt if kindly man cannot bring himself to say these words even if he believes them but i do think that in some measure they point the way to what may wisely be taught there is a practice of medicine the common practice that is concerned with the body only and with its chemical and mechanical reactions we can have nothing but respect and admiration for the men who go on year after year in the eager pursuit of this calling we know that such a work is necessary that it is just as important as the educational practice of which i write we know that without the physical side medicine would fail of its usefulness and that disease and death would reap far richer harvests i only wish the two naturally related aspects of our dealing with patients might not be so completely separated that they lose sight of each other as a matter of fact both elements are necessary to our human welfare if medicine devotes itself altogether to the cure and prevention of physical disease it will miss half of its possibilities it is equally true that if we forget the physical necessities in our zeal for spiritual hygiene we shall get and deserve complete and humiliating failure many men will say why mix the two why not let the preachers and the philosophers preach and the doctors follow their own ways for the most part this may have to be the arrangement but the doctor who can see and treat the spiritual needs of his patient will always be more likely to cure in the best sense than the doctor who only sees half the picture on the other hand the philosopher is likely to be a comparatively poor doctor because he knows nothing of medicine and so he can only see the other half of the picture there is much to be said for the religion of medicine if it can be kept free from cant if it can be simple and rational enough to be available for the whole world end of chapter 2 chapter 3 of the untroubled mind by herbert j hall md this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3. Thought and Work I wish I had a trade. It would animate my arms and tranquillize my brain. Senancor Do ye next day thingy. Old English proverb Since our minds are so constantly filled with anxiety, there would seem to be at least one sure way to be rid of it to stop thinking a great many people believe that the mind will become less effective that life will become dull and purposeless unless they are constantly thinking and planning and arranging their affairs i believe that the mind may easily and wisely be free from conscious thought a good deal of the time and that the greatest progress and development in mind 
often comes when the thinker is virtually at rest, when his mind is to all intents and purposes blank. The busy, unconscious mind does its best work in the serenity of an atmosphere which does not interfere and confuse. It is true that the greatest conceptions do not come to the untrained and undisciplined mind. But do we want great conceptions all the time? There is a technical training for the mind which is, of course, necessary for special accomplishments, but this is quite another matter. Even this kind of thought must not obtrude too much, lest we become conscious of our mental processes, and so end in confusion. One of the greatest benefits of work with the hands, or of objective and constructive work with the mind, is that it saves us from unending hours of thinking. Work should, of course, find its fullest justification as an expression of faith. If we have ever so dim a vision of a greater significance in life, of its close relationship to infinite things, we become thereby conscious of the need of service, of the need of work. It is the easy, natural expression of our faith, the inevitable result of a spiritual contact with the great working forces of the world. It is work above all else that saves us from the disasters of conflicting thought. A few years ago a young man came to me, suffering from too much thinking. He had just been graduated from college and his head was full of confused ideas and emotions. He was also very tired having overworked in his preparation for examinations, and because he had not taken the best care of his body. The symptoms he complained of were sleeplessness and worry, together with the inevitable indigestion and headache. Of course, as a physician, I went over the bodily functions carefully, and studied, as far as I might, into the organic conditions. I could find no evidence of physical disease. I did not say, there is nothing the matter with you, for the man was sick. I told him that he was tired, that he had thought too much, that he was too much concerned about himself, and as a result of all this his bodily functions were temporarily upset. He thought he ought to worry about himself, because otherwise he would not be trying to get well. I explained to him that this mistaken obligation was the common reason for worry and that in this case, at least, it was quite unnecessary and even harmful for him to go on thinking about himself. That helped a little, but not nearly enough, because when a man has overworked, when he has begun to worry, and when his various bodily functions show results of worry, no reasoning, no explanations, can wholly relieve him. I said to this young man, in spite of your discomforts, in spite of your depression and concern in regard to yourself, you will get well if you stop thinking about the matter altogether. You must be first convinced that it is best for you to stop thinking, that no harm or violence can result, and then you must be helped in this direction by going to work with your hands. That will be life and progress. It will lead you to health. Fortunately, I had had some experience with nervous illness, and I knew that unless I managed for this man the character and extent of his work, he would not only fail in it, but of its object, and so become more confused and discouraged. I knew the troubled mind, in this instance, might find its solace and its relief in work, but that I must choose the work carefully to suit the individual and I must see that the nervously fatigued body was not pushed too hard. In the town where I live is a blacksmith shop, presided over by a genial old man who has been a blacksmith since he was a boy, and in whose hands iron is like clay. I took my patient down to the smithy and said, Here is the young man whom I want to put to work. He will pay for the chance. I want you first to teach him to make hand-wrought nails. This was a good deal of a joke to the smith and to the patient, but they saw that I was in earnest and agreed to go ahead. We got together the proper tools and proceeded to make nails, a job which is really not very difficult. After an hour's work, I called off my patient, much to his disgust, for he was just beginning to be interested. 
but I knew that if he were to keep on until fatigue should come, the whole matter would end in trouble. So the next day, with some new overalls and a leather apron added to the equipment, we proceeded to another hour's work. We went on this way for three or four days before the time was increased. The interest of the patient was always fresh. He was eager for more, and he did not taste the dregs of fatigue. Yet he did get wholesome exercise, and he did get the strong turning of the mind from its worry and concern. Of course, the rest of the day was taken care of in one way or another, but the work was the central feature. In a week we were at it two hours a day, in three weeks four hours, and in a month five hours. He had made a handsome display of hand-wrought nails, a superior line of pokers and shovels for fireplaces, together with a number of very respectable andirons. On each of these larger pieces of handiwork, my patient had stamped his initials with a little steel die that was made for him. Each piece was his own, each piece was the product of his own versatility and his own strength. His pride and pleasure in this work were very great, and well they might be, for it is a fine thing to have learned to handle so intractable a material as iron. But in handling the iron patiently and consistently until he could do it without too much conscious thinking, and so without effort, he had also learned to handle himself naturally, more simply and easily. As a matter of fact, the illness which had brought this boy to me was pretty nearly cured by his blacksmithing, because it was an illness of the mind and of the nerves, and not of the body, although the body had suffered in its turn. That young man, instead of becoming a nervous invalid as he might have done, is now working steadily in partnership with his father, in business in the city. I had found him a very interesting patient, full of originality and not at all the tedious and boresome person he might have been had I listened day after day, week after week, to the recital of his ills. I was willing to listen, I did listen, but I also gave him a new trend of life, which pretty soon made his complaints sound hollow, and then disappear. Of course, the problem is not always so simple as this and we must often deal with complexities of body and mind requiring prolonged investigation and treatment. I cite this case because it shows clearly that relief from some forms of nervous illness can come when we stop thinking, when we stop analysing, and then back up our position with prescribed work. There may be some nervous invalids who read these lines who will say, but I have tried so many times to work and have failed. Unfortunately, such failure must often occur unless we can proceed with care and with understanding. But the principle remains true, although it must be modified in an infinite variety to meet the changing conditions of individuals. I see a great many people who are conscientiously trying to get well from nervous exhaustion. They almost inevitably try too hard. They think and worry too much about it, and so exhaust themselves the more. This is the greater pity because it is the honest and the conscientious people who make the greatest effort. It is very hard for them to realize that they must stop thinking, stop trying, and if possible get to work before they can accomplish their end. We shall have to repeat to them over and over again that they must stop thinking the matter out, because the thing they are attempting to overcome is too subtle to be met in that way. So, if they are fortunate, they may rid themselves of the vagueness and uncertainty of life, until all the multitude of details which go to make up life lose their desultoriness and their lack of meaning, and they may find themselves no longer the subjects of physical or nervous exhaustion. End of chapter 3《チャプター4》《The Untroubled Mind》by Herbert J. Hall, M.D. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《チャプター4》Idleness. O ye, who have your eyeballs vexed and tired, feast them upon the wideness of the sea. Keats. 
extreme busyness, whether at school or college, kirk or market, is a symptom of deficient vitality, and a faculty for idleness implies a Catholic appetite and a strong sense of personal identity. Stevenson It is an unfortunate fact that very few people are able to be idle successfully. I think it is not so much because we misuse idleness as because we misinterpret it, that the long days become increasingly demoralizing. I would ask no one to accept a forced idleness without objection or regret. Such an acceptance would imply a lack of spirit, to say the least. But idleness and rest are not incompatible. Neither are idleness and service, nor idleness and contentment. If we can look upon rest as a preparation for service, if we can make it serve us in the opportunity it gives for quiet growth and legitimate enjoyment, then it is fully justified and it may offer advantages and opportunity of the best. The chief trouble with idleness is that it so often means introspection, worry and impatience, especially to those conscientious souls who would fain be about their business. I have for a long time been accustomed to combat the worry and fret of necessary idleness, not by forbidding it, not by advising struggle and fight against it, but by insisting that the best way to get rid of it is to leave it alone, to accept it. When we do this there may come a kind of fallow time in which the mind enriches and refreshes itself beyond our conception. I would rather my patient who must rest for a long time would give up all thought of method, would give up all idea of making his mind follow any particular line of thought or absence of thought. I know that the mind which has been under conscious control a good deal of the time is apt to rebel at this freedom and to indulge in all kinds of alarming extravagances. I am sure, however, that the best way to meet these demands for conscious control is to be careless of them, to be willing to experience these extravagances and inconsistencies without fear, in the belief that finally will come a quiet and peace which will be all that we can ask, the peace of mind that is unguided, in the conscious and literal sense, is a thing which too few of us know. Mr. Arnold Bennett, in his little book, how to live on twenty-four hours a day, teaches that we should leave no time unused in our lives, that we should accomplish a great deal more and be infinitely more effective and progressive if we devoted our minds to the definite working out of necessary problems whenever those times occur in which we are apt to be desultory. I wish here to make a plea for desultoriness and for an idleness which goes even beyond the idleness of the man who reads the newspaper and forgets what he has read. It seems to me better, whether we are sick or well, to allow long periods in our lives when we think only casually. To the good old adage, work while you work and play while you play, we might well add, rest while you rest, lest in the end you should be unable successfully either to work or play. A man is not necessarily condemned to tortures of mind because he must rest for a week or a month or a year. I know that there must be anxious times, especially when idleness means dependence, and when it brings hardship to those who need our help. But the invalid must not try constantly to puzzle the matter out. If we do not make ourselves sick with worry, we shall be able some time to approach active life with sufficient frankness and force. It is the constant effort of the poor, tired mind to solve its problems that not only fails of its object, but plunges the invalid deeper into discouragement and misunderstanding. How cruel this is, and how unfortunate that it should come more commonly to those who try the hardest to overcome their handicaps, to throw off the yoke of idleness and to be well. When you have tried your best to get back to your work and have failed, when you have done this not once but many times, it is inevitable that misunderstanding should creep in inevitable that you should question very deeply and doubt not infrequently. Yet the chances are that one of the reasons for your failure is that you have tried too hard, that you have not known how to rest. When you have learned how to rest, when you have learned to put off thinking and planning until the mind becomes fresh and clear, when you are in a fair way to know the joy of idleness and the peace of rest, 
you are a great deal more likely to get back to efficiency and to find your way along the great paths of activity into the world of life it is not so much the idleness then as the attempt to overcome its irksomeness that makes this condition painful the invalid in bed is in a trap to be tormented by his thoughts unless he knows the meaning of successful idleness this knowledge may come to him by such strategy as i have suggested by giving up the struggle against worry and fret but peace will come surely steadily with healing in its wings when the mind is changed altogether when life becomes free because of a growth and development that finds significance even in idleness that sees the world with wise and patient eyes in a way it does not matter your physical condition or mine if our eyes have seen the glory that deifies life and makes even waste places beautiful what is that view from your window as you lie in your bed a bit of the sea if you are fortunate a corner of garden surely the top of an elm tree against the blue what is it but the revelations of a god in the world there is enough that is sad and unhappy but over all are these simple ineffable things if the garden is an expression of god in the world then the world and life are no longer meaningless even idleness becomes in some degree bearable because it is a part of a significant world unfortunately the idleness of disability often means pain the wear and tear of physical or nervous suffering that is another matter we cannot meet it fully with any philosophy my patients very often beg to know the best way to bear pain how they may overcome the attacks of nerves that are harder to bear than pain to such a question i can only say that the time to bear pain is before and after live in such a way in the times of comparative comfort that the attacks are less likely to appear and easier to bear when they do come after the pain or the nervous attack is over that is the time to prevent the worst features of another forget the distress live simply and happily in spite of the memory and you will have done all that the patient himself can do to ward off or to make tolerable the next occasion of suffering pain itself pure physical pain is a matter for the physician's judgment it is his business to seek out the causes and apply the remedy end of chapter four chapter five of the untroubled mind by herbert j hall m d this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 Rules of the Game It is not growing like a tree in bulk, doth make man better be. Ben Jonson It is a good thing to have a sound body, better to have a sane mind, but neither is to be compared to that aggregate of virile and decent qualities which we call character. Theodore Roosevelt the only effective remedy against inexorable necessity is to yield to it. Petrarch When I go out among my patients, most of them, as it happens, nervously sick, I sometimes stop to consider why it is they are ill. I know that some are so because of physical weakness over which they have no control, that some are suffering from the effects of carelessness, some from willfulness, and more from simple ignorance of the rules of the game there are so many rules that no one will ever know them all but it seems that we live in a world of laws and that if we transgress those laws by ever so little we must suffer equally whether our transgression is a mistake or not and whether we happen to be saints or sinners there are laws also which have to do with the recovery of poise and balance when these have been lost these laws are less well observed and understood than those which determine our downfall. The more gross illnesses, from accident, contagion, and malignancy, we need not consider here, but only those intangible injuries that disable people who are relatively sound in the physical sense. 
it is true that nervous troubles may cause physical complications and that physical disease very often coexists with nervous illness but it is better for us now to make an artificial separation just what happens in the human economy when a nervous breakdown comes nobody seems to know but mind and body cooperate to make the patient miserable and helpless it may be nature's way of holding us up and preventing further injury the hold-up is severe usually and becomes in itself a thing to be managed the rules we have wittingly or unwittingly broken are often unknown to us but they exist in the all-wise providence and we may guess by our own suffering how far we have overstepped them if a man runs into a door in the dark we know all about that the case is simple but if he runs overtime at his office and hastens to be rich with the result of a nervous dyspepsia that is a mystery here is a girl who came out last year she was apparently strong and her mother was ambitious for her social progress that meant four nights a week for several months at dances and dinners getting home at three a m or later it was gay and delightful while it lasted but it could not last and the girl went to pieces suddenly her back gave out because it was not strong enough to stand the dancing and the long continued physical strain the nerves gave out because she did not give her faculties time to rest and perhaps because of a love affair that supervened the result was a year of invalidism and then because the rules of recovery were not understood several years more of convalescence such common rules should be well enough understood but they are broken everywhere by the wisest people the common case of the broken-down schoolteacher is more unfortunate the tragedy and others like it are more often i believe due to unwise choice of profession in the first place the women's colleges are turning out hundreds of young women every year who naturally consider teaching as the field most appropriate and available probably only a very small proportion of these girls are strong enough physically or nervously to meet the growing demands of the schools they may do well for a time some of them unusually well for it is the sensitive highly strung organism that is appreciative and effective after a while the worry and fret of the requirements and the constant nag of the schoolroom have their effect upon those who are foredoomed to failure in that particular field the plight of such young women is particularly hard for they are usually dependent upon their work it is after all not so much the things we do as the way we do them and what we think about them that accomplishes nervous harm strangely enough the sense of effort and the feeling of our own inadequacy damage the nervous system quite as much as the actual physical effort the attempt to catch up with life and with affairs that go on too fast for us is a frequent and harmful deflection from the rules of the game few of us avoid it life comes at us and goes by very fast tasks multiply and we are inadequate responsibilities increase before we are ready they bring fatigue and confusion we cannot shirk and be true having done all you reasonably can stop whatever may be the consequences that is a rule i would enforce if i could to do more is to drag and fail so defeating the end of your efforts if it turns out that you are not fit for the job you have undertaken give it up and find another or modify that one until it comes within your capacity it takes courage to do this more courage sometimes than is needed to make us stick to the thing we are doing rarely however will it be necessary for us to give up if we will undertake and consider for the day only such part of our task as we are able to perform the trouble is that we look at our work or our responsibility all in one piece and it crushes us if we cannot arrange our lives so that we may meet their obligations a little at a time then we must admit failure and try again on what may seem a lower plane that is what i consider the brave thing to do i would honor the factory superintendent 
who, finding himself unequal to his position, should choose to work at the bench where he could succeed perfectly. The habit of uncertainty in thought and action, bred, as it sometimes is, from a lack of faith in man and in God, is, nevertheless, a thing to be dealt with sometimes by itself. Not infrequently it is a petty habit that can be corrected by the exercise of a little will-power. I believe it is better to decide wrong a great many times, doing it quickly, than to come to a right decision after weakly vacillating. As a matter of fact, we may trust our decisions to be fair and true if our life's ideals are beautiful and true. We may improve our indecisions a great deal by mastering their unhappy details, but we shall not finally overcome them until life rings true, and until all our acts and thoughts become the solid and inevitable expression of a healthy growing regard for the best in life, a call to right living that is no mean dictum of policy, but which is renewed every morning as the sun comes out of the sea. However inconsequential the habit of indecision may seem, it is really one of the most disabling of bad habits. Its continuance contributes largely to the sum of nervous exhaustion. Whatever its origin, whether it stands in the relation of cause or effect, it is an indulgence that insidiously takes the snap and sparkle out of life, and leaves us for the time being colourless and weak. Next to uncertainty, an uninspired certainty is wrecking to the best of human prospects. The man whose one idea is of making himself and his family materially comfortable, or even rich, may not be coming to nervous prostration, but he is courting a moral prostration that will deny him all the real riches of life, and that will in the end reward him with a troubled mind, a great, unsatisfied longing, unless, to be sure, he is too smug and satisfied to long for anything. The larger life leads us inevitably away from ourselves, away from the super-requirements of our families. It demands of them and of ourselves an unselfishness that is born of a love that finds its expression in the service of God. And what is the service of God, if it is not such an entering into the divine purposes and spirit that we become with God recreators in the world, working factors in the higher evolution of humanity? While we live we shall get and save, we shall use and spend, we shall serve the needs of those dependent upon us, but we shall not line the family nest so softly that our children become powerless, we shall not confine our charities to the specified channels, where our names will be praised and our credit increased. We shall give and serve in secret places with our hearts in our deeds then we may possess the untroubled mind, a treasure too rich to be computed. We shall not have it for the seeking. It may exist in the midst of what men call privations and sorrows, but it will exist in a very large sense and it will be ours. The so-called hard-headed business man who never allows himself to be taken advantage of, whose dealings are always strict and uncompromising, is very apt to be a particularly miserable invalid when he is ill. I cannot argue in favour of business laxity. I know the imperative need of exactness and finality. But I do believe that if we are to possess the untroubled mind, we must make our lives larger than the field of dollars and cents. The charity that develops in us will make us truly generous and free from the reaction of hardness. It is a great temptation to go on multiplying the rules of the game. There are so many sensible and necessary pieces of advice which we all need to have emphasized. That is the course we must try to avoid. The child needs to be told, arbitrarily for a while, what is right and what is wrong, that he must do this and he must not do that. The time comes, however, when the growing instinct toward right living is the thing to foster, not the details of life which will inevitably take care of themselves, if the underlying principle is made right. It must be the ideal of moral teaching to make clear and pure the source of action. Then the stream will be clear and pure, 
such a stream will purify itself and neutralize the dangerous inflow along its banks it is true that great harm may come from the polluted inflows but they will be less and less harmful as the increasing current from the good source flows down we shall have to look well to our habits lest serious ills befall but that must never be the main concern or we shall find ourselves living very narrow and labored lives we shall find that we are failing to observe one of the most important rules of the game End of chapter 5